Hi everyone, this is Rishabh. Uh, I work at Google Brain on program synthesis. Uh, and in this quarter, I'm co-teaching this class with, with Tom. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be in person today as I'm traveling in India right now to visit family. But hopefully in a couple of more weeks, I'll be there in person and I'm excited to meet all of you. So, so today, actually, I wanted to give a brief over, overview on, on some of the work on program synthesis uh, we've been doing. And also talk a little bit about uh, some of the interesting uh, future ideas uh, that are quite exciting in this domain and, and hopefully some of, the, some of them might turn out to be good projects for you in the class. Um, so, so actually this, wo uh, this work I'll be presenting today is joint work with lots of great colleagues from Microsoft Research, uh, Google Brain and DeepMind. Um, so, so actually before getting into um, uh, the, the material, I wanted to make a small uh, analogy <coughs> which is kind of interesting to think uh, more deeply upon. Uh, so, so we've seen lots of uh, great breakthroughs in deep learning uh, and it's kind of interesting to look at the progression um, of, of, of techniques. For example, we, we saw lots of uh, breakthroughs in image recognition and vision systems. Then, then we've seen lots of breakthroughs in speech and nowadays we keep seeing new and newer uh, uh, in, uh, in interesting ideas in, in understanding language. And it's kind of interesting to think about uh, when, when humans are born, it's kind of interesting, a similar progression we see. Uh, when, when we're born, we start seeing things, then we start saying things, and then after that, we start saying things that make sense. It's kind of a very interesting parallel. So, so nowadays, kids, after learning how to speak, uh, the next thing they do is programming. Uh, so, so here's my three-year-old niece uh, writing, writing Python programs. So it's natural we should build systems uh, to to learn how to program, uh, but but on a more serious note, actually, a lot of these breakthroughs have been uh, mostly on perceptual tasks, learning patterns to to decide which action to take. But but to actually get towards more general intelligence and to, for able to uh, for our uh, learning algorithms to be able to do more things, uh, actually we we need systems that can learn more complicated things. Uh, and actually, one domain. Uh, uh, going towards that is algorithmic tasks where the system has to learn precise sequence of actions to perform a, a complex reasoning task and and to represent these algor uh, algorithmic tasks actually programs are quite quite natural choice that's how as humans we we write algorithms uh, so 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 the hope is by learning to uh, by by learning um, uh, to uh, to learn programs we, we can enable these algorithms to perform more complicated things more complicated tasks than it it can do currently uh, programs actually since, since we uh, if, if if we're generating programs uh, there's a more structured output that's that's being predicted rather than just a, a set of low level weights uh, so they also tend to generalize better because of the prior of the language and they are also naturally more in interpretable because uh, hopefully someone can look at the generated program and see whether it's doing the right thing or not and in principle can also update it uh, in case it, it's not doing the, the desired things. So, so here let's step back and see uh, uh, how humans today program. So typically uh, programmers look at some specification. It could either be set of IO input output examples or test cases. It can also be natural language. And sometimes can also be partial programs. So here's a piece of code that doesn't quite work yet, but I want to modify it to make it work. So specification uh, of the task can come in many different forms. Uh, and then programmers are able to take all that uh, specification and write some low level piece of code that satisfies the specification. Now, if we want to dig it, uh, dig a little deeper into it, uh, basically this involves few capabilities uh, that, that we, we develop over time. Uh, so first of all, uh, there has to be uh, some sort of logical reasoning that needs to be performed to be able to find the right logic to solving for solving this task or, or writing the correct algorithm for it. And it's also not the case that we just uh, actually naturally start programming uh, uh, quite quite well from the beginning. So we a lot of us take classes and courses, and and then over time with more experience we get better. Uh, and then also a lot of times actually it's not uh, uh, from scratch or a lot of programming tasks are done. They are actually 
uh, lots of samples are available online, for example, at GitHub and other places that we, programmers typically utilize. So our goal was actually can we build systems or agents that can try to try to actually um, have similar capabilities uh, develop maybe in the beginning it's not so great but over time uh, it gets better from experience and then it, it's able to ingest specification in many many different forms and then the hope is actually we can augment uh, uh, the, the, the program experience we have today so that uh, all programmers in the world can achieve even more than, than what they can do today. Um, and uh, another vision we had while starting out this project was actually can we build systems that can learn to program similar to how, how uh, top programmers perform and one way to evaluate this might be actually can we win a programming contest or a similar uh, complexity task uh, can the agents learn to write programs at that level um, uh, and and that's a that's a quite longer term vision. Uh, people are making progress. Uh, this this new and newer um, uh, ideas uh, coming up, but but that's still still a, a slightly longer term goal. Uh, and our hope is in the meantime, uh, some of the ideas that we are developing for representing programs and using search to uh, uh, to find the right program could be used for many other tasks uh, uh, for uh, for helping programmers and and. It's also quite similar to the theme of the class uh, on trying trying to build representations for programming a system. So, so for example, some of the work uh, uh, that, that we have been doing uh, is on trying to build these systems to automatically find bugs in programs and repair them. Uh, we could use it for generating test cases automatically to find security bugs. It could be used for program optimization and many, 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 many other uh, uh, applications can be built to, to augment the programming experience and help developers write, write more correct code. Uh, so, so before getting into program synthesis, I also wanted to contrast it with, with something which we'll call program induction, uh, which, which has also seen lots and lots of interest recently and there are many, many cool, cool ideas that have come up recently. Um, so for example, uh, uh, this work from DeepMind on differentiable neural computer. The idea here is that uh, we augment a, 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 some some standard uh, LSTM controller with access to memory with which it can read and write in a differentiable way, such that now it's it's more structured and it can learn a more complicated task by um, having an explicit memory to read and write to. For example, for tasks like copying an array or sorting an array. It, it can utilize memory in a way that can help it generalize better. Uh, another very interesting piece of work uh, is this work on neural RAM, where the idea is to, to learn circuits given a set of modules for, for different tasks, uh, given set of improper examples. So, so the idea is, let's say I'm given some n number of modules. Uh, in this case, they, were con they considered 14 modules, uh, a module that can do addition, uh, increment, decrement, um, it can check whether something is zero or not and then it has access also has access to memory to read and write to uh, and the high level idea here is also similar we uh, come up with some differentiable representation of uh, these modules uh, which are then uh, which is then uh, learned uh, an LSTM uh, controller learns to compose these modules in a way such that the input of examples are met and one way to implement this is by actually uh, having a controller predict at every timestamp which module to use and, and also choose the corresponding uh, arguments for them. Uh, so, so in all of these works, actually, one way to characterize them is basically we are taking uh, uh, these neural architectures and augmenting them with uh, data structures, uh, with differentiable data structures like memory, stacks, and other, other structures. And we are, we are uh, increasing the capacity of these networks with, with these priors, more structured priors. And then, uh, and, and the nice thing is these architectures are now able to learn more algorithmic tasks. Um, uh, this, this approach uh, also has few cons in the sense, uh, first of all, in, in these networks, the network, the learned network itself is the program. Uh, so, 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 uh, it, it has some some shortcomings because of that in the sense 
uh, inherently it's it's not going to generalize uh, perfectly because there's always um, uh, this stochastic behavior and then uh, it's, it's it's quite difficult to learn like very very uh, precise symbolic um, structure um, then uh, another shortcoming is is that it requires lots of examples training examples to train in the order of many thousands or uh, millions uh, also these are typically trained for every task uh, and 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 also they are not very interpretable because the model itself is is is, is the program so in, in contrast in synthesis actually what we want is we want the output to be a program so so instead of having these low level weight matrices uh, we have functional abstractions defining the language operators and constructs and then uh, the the uh, natural benefit of that is it, it tends to generalize better but but one of the main shortcomings is that it also makes our search problem difficult because now it's more discrete and we can't do standard uh, continuous optimization technically uh, it also uses lots of examples and then Typically, for every task, we have to train it again. But it's more inter interpretable because the output is a program. Now, in, in contrast, actually, if we look at what we call meta neural program synthesis, the idea there is that uh, instead of uh, training one model per task, actually, what if can we train the same model for many different tasks in the domain? And the natural benefit of that is that uh, for every task, we don't need so much data to train. Uh, we can probably learn uh, correct programs or desired programs in a few examples, as few as maybe five examples. Uh, this is also quite closer to how humans program in the sense, given few uh, test cases in a, in a given uh, uh, cons constrained domain, it's typically clear uh, what program one needs to write. It, it, like humans don't need uh, millions of uh, test cases to find the right functionality. So, so that was an inspiration towards, towards getting to a system like that. So I'll, I'll mostly talk about uh, meta neural program synthesis uh, uh, in, in, in the next few slides, and then I'll revisit some of the other applications. So to get started, uh, I want to talk about the very first uh, work we did a couple of years back on, on uh, neural symbolic program synthesis. And for this domain, we chose this system called FlashFill, which, which is something we built a few years back uh, uh, for for excel end users who want to perform who wanted to perform uh, sophisticated regular expression based data cleaning but but they didn't they didn't they weren't really programmers so then they didn't know exactly how to use regular expressions uh, so in this case um, as you can see in in this animation uh, users typically provide one or two examples uh, in their spreadsheet and then the system then learns the corresponding program given the improper example uh, and then runs the program on the remaining entries in the spreadsheet so that they don't have to manually enter thousands of thousands of rows. Um, so, so at high level, the way this technique works is that uh, uh, it has a domain specific language behind it. So it's a subset of all things one can do in Excel. Uh, it, it's mostly targeted towards regular expression based uh, data transformations. So if you look at the language, it's essentially a concatenation of n substrings at the top level and then each substring can be of two forms it can either be a constant string or a substring defined by two positions left and right and the positions are typically regular expression based for example here it says kth occurrence of some regular expression either start of it or end of it so it, it will become more clear from an from an example let's say some user wanted to perform this task they have a set of names in the input column and they would want to transform the names in a consistent form, um, uh, let's say last name, comma, first first name, first character dot. So, so the system does not know anything about names. It's all based on some regular expressions. So one way to perform this task in our language would be something like uh, concatenate four things, four substrings, where the first substring is essentially a regular expression for last word in the, in the input. Uh, second string is constant comma white space. Uh, third substring is is basically uh, extracting the first character of input, and fourth substring is constant string dot. So this would be a way to write this uh, uh, write a program to do this task in our language. And, and there are actually millions of such programs in the language because it's it's quite expressive. 
Now the task is that we don't want users to write programs in the language. We would like to automatically generate such programs from, from the examples or test cases somebody provided. So, so previously in the flash fuel system, we, we developed uh, lots of algorithms, uh, very efficient ways to search these things and lots of manual analysis was done to make it efficient. So in this work, we wanted to see actually can we automate uh, such discovery of learning uh, tasks and then can the system automatically just from experience without having any kind of human knowledge uh, learn to discover uh, such programs from the examples. So at high level, this would be general methodology. And this is something we'll, we'll see later in, in the talk as well, uh, how one can use it for even other, other programming tasks. So, so, uh, so the high level idea is that for training these models, we need some training data. And, and typically we don't have access to lots of uh, such, such programs in, in the real world, given some specification and programs, especially, especially if we are considering some domain specific language, it's even, uh, since this is something actually uh, not not many people use or it could be something you are designing yourself the language so, so it's difficult to get like real world data sets and secondly even for real world programming language getting the specification is quite difficult but but one nice thing about programs compared to other domains we'll see is that because they have well-defined semantics uh, one can actually automatically generate data sets uh, to, to train these models. So the high level methodology for generating the data sets is, looks something like this. You start with some domain specific language. In, in our case, let's say flash fill language I showed you earlier. Then what the sampler does, it samples random programs from the language and then samples a random input, runs the program on the input, gets the output. So, so this way I can randomly generate a set of input output examples together with the program. Uh, and then I can generate millions and millions of them. And that becomes our training data set and we can train a model to get a synthesis system out of it. Now, uh, now typically when I um, give this presentation in person, I would ask question about what can go wrong here. And, and, and maybe that could be a, a homework exercise or, or something we can discuss afterwards. There are many things that can go wrong here. And then the question is, uh, for example, uh, you sample a program that that is non-terminating or you sample an input on which when you run the program it's like false and then there are ways to get around it um, in in some domains it would be more difficult than the others but but there are ways to actually generate training data uh, using programs and i was as i was saying earlier this we can do it here uh, compared uh, unlike other domains like images or videos uh, here since programs have well-defined syntax and semantics we can leverage that to generate the training data. So to make it more concrete, let's say for the language I showed you earlier, uh, we could we could uh, generate training in this way. So, so let's say I sample a random program. In this case, the program concatenates three things. The third alphanumeric token followed by a string starting from first colon, and then maybe the first four characters of the string. So this is a random program I just sampled from the language. And now I sample an input, run the program, get output. So in this case, to make sure program doesn't seg fault, we, we, make, uh, we ensure that when we are sampling random string as input, the input has at least three alphanumeric tokens, at least has one colon, and at least has, first four, uh, for, uh, at least has four characters so that all the regular expressions are, are okay and valid. So then we sample these five inputs. We can run the program and get corresponding output. And now that becomes our training data, five input output pairs. And the job of the learner is to generate the program that was used to produce the data. Uh, and actually we can sample even larger programs. So here's the length um, eight or nine expression program, and we generate inputs and corresponding outputs. Now we're gonna train our model on this synthetically generated data set. Uh, but, but, but to see actually whether it learned the right concept, whether it learned to generalize and learn to actually really program in this language, we're going to use real world data sets to test it. So, so these are some examples that Excel users wanted to perform uh, uh, on the spreadsheets. And, and the hope is that if the system has really learned the right, right semantics and right ways to search, it can generate the correct programs for, for, for these cases that they have never seen uh, during training. So at, at high level, the architecture looks something like this. It's similar to encoder-decoder architecture, where 
our encoder actually takes improper examples as input and embeds them into some vector space. And then the decoder is going to learn a distribution over programs in the language uh, conditioned on the uh, input output embedding. Um, and in this case, actually, we use a tree decoder. We'll see uh, some other decoders later in the talk. Um, and, uh, and in this case, actually, it's, it's, it's basically uh, outputting the AST of the program, uh, which, which comes from the, from the grammar of the language. So uh, actually, intuitively, one way to think about this process is that you can imagine your programming language DSL to be a grammar, and like a context-free grammar. And, and the goal is to expand derivations in the grammar. So you can expand uh, every non-terminal starting from the start symbol until you get a tree uh, derivation that has no more uh, non-terminals. So that's like a program in the language and you can evaluate to see whether it works or not on the examples. So, so typically since these languages are quite rich, uh, doing this uh, enumeration doesn't work because the space is just too large and we uh, we, we can't uh, enumerate all possible programs, even up to a given bound, it's, it's quite large. Uh, so, so the basic idea of this uh, approach is that can we actually, instead of enumerating all possible choices in, of, uh, of programs in our language, can we somehow guide the search? Can, can the network actually give probabilities to different different expansions so that uh, it's, uh, we, we can get towards the right program in, in as, uh, as few attempts as possible? Uh, so so uh, one way to think about this approach is that we are learning a function f that takes two arguments, um, basically a partial tree that it, it has found till now and the input of example, some embedding of that, and returns ways to expand the program to incrementally build it uh, such that at the end we get a final program. And you can imagine running this function f recursively starting from the start symbol of the grammar and then recursively applying it again and again until we get a program that has no more non-terminal. Uh, so that would be a setting for this neural guided search. Now there are two main challenges uh, in this approach I showed you. Uh, first is actually program representation. Uh, how do we represent programs or these tree structured ASTs into vector spaces? And how do we represent examples into vector spaces uh, to condition our our generated model. So let's go over each one of them briefly. So for representing uh, infraproper examples, uh, or for representing uh, programs in vector spaces, we devise something which we call recursive reverse recursive neural networks, R3NN, which the name will become more clear uh, quite soon. But at high level, uh, it works like this. So let's imagine I have a small programming language on my right. Uh, it's a small context-free grammar. Then this network has a set of lookup embeddings. First, we assign an embedding for every symbol in the grammar, both terminals and non-terminals. And then we have another embedding for every rule in the grammar. Uh, for uh, every LHS and RHS pair, we have this, this uh, embedding. And then we have two sets of matrices, W and G. Uh, one for forward pass and one for backward pass. Uh, so actually, let's look at an example to make it more clear. So let's say I have an expression e op to e op to e. So it's, it's, it's some derivation in my grammar. And I want to embed it into vector space. Uh, so the high level idea is that uh, we first have the tree structure with us, which comes from parsing the expression. Then we start bottom up. So we first uh, assign re vector representation to every leaf. And these are just lookup embeddings. I, uh, as we saw earlier, every symbol in the grammar is associated with, a, with an embedding. So we first assign embeddings to every leaf. Now we start going up the tree. For every parent node, uh, we look at the children embeddings and use the W matrix uh, we have for every, every uh, rule, uh, every, every operator. And uh, uh, we compute parents' representation from children's representation. Uh, so, so, so this way we keep going up the tree and every time we uh, compute parents' representation from the children's representation and, and at the end we get roots' representation. And this is actually quite similar to recursive neural networks uh, that, that uh, many, uh, men, uh, many uh, researchers have used for, uh, for embedding natural language sentences using parse trees. Uh, so, 
so doing this actually we get a representation of the root but our problem is actually to expand these trees not so much get one representation of the tree uh, so for doing that actually we come up with this uh, backward pass which we call reverse recursive uh, in this case the idea is that uh, now we start with the roots representation and now we want to propagate information downwards from top to bottom uh, so, so now we are going to use our second set of bait matrices for every rule. Basically, G is here, who, uh, whose goal is to generate embeddings for children given parents' representation. So in this case, given the root, uh, the G matrix would compute uh, a representation for node N2, uh, basically the children representation. And, and this way we keep going down the tree and every time we compute children's representation, at the end, we get updated leaf representation for all leaf nodes, uh, five prime, uh, and uh, and that those are the ones we were going to use to uh, construct our distribution over expansions. Now, one actually very interesting thing, uh, which is also quite interesting to think about, is doing this back uh, upward and backward pass. Uh, now, every node implicitly knows about every other node in the tree because let's say n6 knows about n5 because there's a path uh, between n5 and n6 over which the information propagated via root so that's a nice property of doing this back upwards and backward pass uh, such that every node knows about every other node in the tree uh, yeah so so now we get updated set of representations for every leaf node and now we just uh, do a dot product with with um, the all possible uh, uh, expansion rules for all non-terminal nodes. And in this way, we get a distribution, probability distribution over all possible choices. And then we just take softmax to, to uh, pick the best best uh, action it displays. And during training, since we generated the program, we know exactly which expansions are should be taken for these examples. And we, we can just have simple cross entropy loss to optimize for um, for the expansions. Uh, now, actually, one more interesting question uh, here uh, one can ask is that, like, we could we could have actually uh, so so right now the the uh, model is making two two decisions in in, in one way. When one can imagine it's also deciding uh, amongst all the possible leaf nodes to expand, which leaf node to expand, and how to expand it, which rule to change, uh, which rule to select. Uh, we could have taken a policy that says always expand the leftmost tree, uh, leftmost leaf node, uh, which is a valid thing uh, and which will probably make the training easier. Uh, but our intuition was actually, as programmers, we typically don't write code oftentimes just left to right or like top to bottom. Sometimes we'll write some piece of code, then we'll go up and write again and modify something else and then we write some other thing. So there's a very non-linear behavior when we write code. And in this case, we wanted to capture that by giving uh, the model freedom to write or select uh, nodes to expand in any order it wants. Um, so, so this was mostly our R3NN network, uh, which gives us a distribution over expansions, which in turn gives us a distribution over programs in the language. Now we, uh, now we want to actually condition this distribution over uh, the specification and in our case these are examples and and we tried many different architectures for this one which worked well was uh, something which we call cross correlation encoder the high level idea of this um, um, encoder is quite simple basically let's imagine we have input and output strings uh, we first run lstm to get hidden states for for uh, each each input and output string then we do. Uh, then we try to align these hidden states in different possible ways. Um, so when we think about one intuition about doing this alignment was that, especially for regular expression-based tasks, it's quite important to know which substring and output comes from which substring and input. And we thought actually doing this alignment could help uh, the model figure out such such uh, dependencies between in input and output. So we do all possible alignments for the two strings, the hidden states, we compute their uh, element by dot product and then pool them in some way, either using sum or max pooling to get a fixed length representation of the examples. And then we use them for training uh, the model end to end 
where both the IO encoder and the decoder are trained simultaneously on our synthetically generated data set. All right, so, so this way we can train our model. Now, uh, now when we try testing it, um, uh, both training and testing this model on our synthetic data, it had some interesting uh, behavior. For example, for programs up to 13 nodes in the AST, it worked reasonably well. Uh, so, so it got about 60% train accuracy and about 63% test accuracy. Um, now, actually, one thing about prog uh, another thing about programs compared to other uh, other domains is that uh, since we can execute them, actually, once we are decoding, we can use that execution knowledge to decode other things. For example, if 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 I label an image as cat, there's not much I can do. I can say it's a cat, but but it's it's difficult to at, at inference time to say. Uh, is it something else? Whereas with programs, actually, if I predict a program, I can run the program on the examples and see whether it actually fits the or whether it produces the right output or not. If not, I can sample the next best. Uh, so, so that's nice. Uh, one uh, another nice property about programs. So, in this case, you will see other rows in this table. Uh, for example, fifty sample means that we can sample top fifty programs, uh, and uh, uh, we can check if any one of them actually works for these examples. So it turns out with 300 samples, we found actually almost all programs up to size 13 AST were, were quite learnable by, by, by this model. Now one ch uh, challenge here was actually training the scalability on larger programs and the performance was, was quite bad on, on larger programs. Uh, and this is something we saw when we took the model to real world task as well on flash fill tasks and for for tasks which had programs up to size 13 AST you know it worked quite well I think it gets about it got about 82 percent accuracy on on that subset but for many pr bigger programs and actually many quite common programs of length 50 or length 60 AST nodes uh, it didn't do well it, it, the training just didn't scale that well and there were many reasons one of the key reasons was uh, batching these trees because every tree in the example has different shape and different structures so we couldn't really have efficient ways to batching them uh, th there's some recent work on on dynamically batching these differently uh, looking structures so so hopefully that can actually uh, help scale it better um, and also more generally uh, uh, I think this notion of uh, backwards and uh, for forward and backward uh, uh, information sharing between nodes is, is quite interesting and uh, hopefully for other tasks we'll see later on um, actually could be quite useful but but the short story was actually it worked quite well for small programs which are already quite surprising to us that it can learn very sophisticated regular expressions uh, but 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 scaling it to large programs was difficult so then we took a step back and said uh, all right that uh, it's difficult to scale up the tree learning, uh, the tree structured learning uh, part. What if actually we said we thought of programs as just simple sequences like natural language and not worry about the tree structure for now. Um, so there's a downside that uh, uh, we're not giving it grammar information and it can actually generate uh, programs with wrong syntax but the hope was if there's large enough data set it can actually learn um, it can hopefully learn the syntax and not make such uh, grammatical mistakes at least in syntax. So the high level uh, idea of that model was uh, quite simple. Uh, you can imagine I have three LSTMs here. The first LSTMs are uh, called input LSTM embeds and input string whose final state is used as the first state of the second output LSTM that embeds output string and finally we have a program LSTM that uh, generates a distribution over s program tokens, tokens in the language. Uh, so that would be like basic sequence to sequence to sequence model. Now we could have different types of attention mechanisms. So for example, the, the system that worked well, best was where we have output LSTM attend over input and the program LSTM attend over both input and output uh, uh, hidden states. So this was for one example, but, but uh, we, we can have multiple examples. And also varying number of examples. Some tasks actually might have four examples, some maybe five. Uh, 
and actually this architecture was nicely allowing for that as well unlike the previous architecture we saw where it it had fixed number of uh, improper examples so in this case it's quite similar to one example case we we train uh, we 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 get program lstm hidden states for all examples individually then uh, we get the hidden vectors for the program lstm and then do some kind of pooling um, uh, we could use some pooling or max pooling uh, and then we generate a distrib distribution over uh, final programs. Um, one intuitive way to think about this is that uh, basically uh, this step uh, is doing some type of intersection operation over programs where the idea is we want to learn programs that work on all the examples rather than individual examples and hopefully the pooling part is capturing that, that uh, intersection operation. And since actually, since now we had no trouble training this because this was actually quite quite optimized for sequence learning, we have quite 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 uh, quite a few accelerator uh, uh, accelerator uh, and uh, architectures that can train this at scale. Uh, we we were able to actually add even new things to the language. We added, as for example, here things like replace, get span, two case, uh, and all all sorts of new operators which. In the past, in the hand-coded uh, algorithm case, every time we added a new operator, it was quite difficult to extend the algorithm, make sure the efficiency still remains. Whereas in this case, it was mostly a matter of adding a new operator, getting generating more data sets, and retraining the model, which was quite nice. Uh, um, which is uh, which is also a benefit of actually le a learning-based approach. And then actually when we tried it on real data set on programs like uh, up to size 60, sometimes even 80, uh, it, it actually worked quite well. Uh, uh, it, it caught about 92% accuracy on the real world data set. And it was actually even better than the flash fill case, which caught about uh, the hand code algorithm, which gets about 89% um, using, using fewer examples. So, uh, so that was actually really, really, uh, 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 quite quite surprising and, and quite quite uh, quite nice that uh, the model was able to learn and, and do so well uh, without without uh, even requiring too much structure information uh, another benefit of this approach was that actually it could also handle noise in the example for example if somebody makes spelling mistakes while giving it in plot for examples the model was still able to generate the right program for majority of the task I think the accuracy just goes down by five five ten percent even when i have tens mistakes in the examples whereas uh, since the hand code algorithm was guaranteed to be sound um, uh, quite often it would say i cannot find a program that is consistent with the example because it, it, it tries to make sure even the example with spelling mistakes work um, so so that's a that's a side benefit of uh, a learning based approach as well and finally even even in cases when it made mistakes, uh, for example, in this case, uh, it it actually learned a program that almost did the right thing, but had a few mistakes in the example. It was quite, quite intuitive in the sense, for example, here it learned that the first part of the output has to be get uh, first two digits because all the examples had two digits in them. Whereas the real program was uh, to get the first number uh, as one of the test input has three digits and one has one digit so 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 given just the four improper examples it's it's reasonable to come up with that program uh, and also briefly we we also tried an induction based approach uh, like similar to some of the approaches we were discussing earlier where the goal was not to produce a program as output but actually given an input generate the corresponding output the model itself is our program so in this case actually uh, in this domain it it did uh, it did work well but but again it wasn't working very well in the sense it gets about 40 to 45 percent accuracy compared to almost 90 uh, 90 plus accuracy we got by synthesis uh, so so that also shows that having this kind of programmatic prior is quite useful uh, when when learning programs uh, so so actually, uh, yeah, this was some an example I showed you for the string transformation case using regular expressions, and the language is mostly functional because it's it just requires a composition of uh, regular expression based functions to perform a task, and and the network seemed to learn quite well uh, on this. 
but but then we tried um, more complicated languages for example Carol which which I'll briefly talk about in a few slides uh, this was a language which has control flow actually this is taught at Stanford uh, introductory programming class so it's kind of interesting that uh, it, it supports loops and conditions uh, without variables so it was an interesting set of challenge to see whether can we train networks to generate programs with such control flow uh, we've, we've also been looking at various subsets of python and r for data data cleaning and data transformation and and one nice thing about these class of languages is that they also have variables uh, that people use for uh, maintaining state unlike unlike other domains there's also some work we are doing on learning grammars of various types um, in terms of specification also i only showed you uh, in probably example based thing uh, one can also imagine using natural language to specify the programs or even partial programs and a beauty of this learning based approach is that actually one can imagine having uh, an additional encoder for natural language component without having to build a separate system so in some sense we can also have multimodal specifications where we could have both natural language and test cases and other things that specify the task now now uh, briefly talking about carol synthesis uh, and probably many of you already know uh, and many of you might have taken the class as well so here the goal is that there's a carol robot in in in, in a 2d world and then it has to put markers in some way or pick up markers and it uh, it typically has to use loops and control flow because it has to work on uh, different size uh, size grid words uh, so for example if this program uses a small uh, repeat uh, statement four times now our goal is actually given the examples can we learn programs uh, of this form uh, in this case also the dsl is quite quite similar to our flashfield dsl uh, quite similar in the sense it has it's 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 it has set of set of functions but one big difference is that it has control flow so it has while loops if conditions nested loops uh, and conditions unlike flash flow which is mostly functional uh, so so that was an interesting challenge here to see whether similar architectures can work well and actually generating data set in this language is more complicated as we were discussing earlier because with loops actually one can get into non termination and different coverage uh, problems but but we were able to use some heuristic techniques to generate data sets to train this model in terms of architecture it's quite similar to the robust fill case we have an encoder decoder architecture decoder is actually uh, again an lstm based sequence model the encoder here instead of uh, an uh, lstm actually in this case we were using cnns uh, with the intuition that actually looking at the since the input and output examples have this visual flav flavor to them, uh, maybe one can uh, utilize patterns in them to identify whether I want to use the loop or condition for this task. Uh, so in this case, actually, supervised learning worked quite well. We were able to solve about uh, eight, uh, learn programs for 80% of the task on, on a synthetic data set. Now, one more thing actually we tried here uh, was uh, this idea of of allowing multiple programs for a given task so let me explain briefly what does that mean so typically when when I have in, when we have input output example based specification there can be multiple programs uh, that are consistent but right now in our training uh, during synthetic data sets we force the model to say no 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 make sure you only generate program that I gave you during training do not generate the other program which may still be actually valid and still be uh, correct uh, but it's just being unfairly penalized because during training it just so happens that we pick some random program for the, those examples so in this case we wanted to see can we actually train with an objective that says any program is okay as long as it produces the right output uh, so so that's where uh, uh, some form of rl comes in because this notion of executing program is non-differentiable uh, but we can't use uh, rl uh, from scratch because the space is so large that uh, if, if we do lots of episodes we won't get any in any reward in in lots and lots of because, because it's very difficult to randomly come up with a program that works uh, so in this case the way we uh, train the model was something like this we first train 
as we saw earlier, supervised model. Then we sample programs from the decoder, and then we run the program on the on the user provided examples to see whether the decoded program actually produces the right output or not. If we if it actually produces the right output, we now uh, give it a, a positive reward plus one. Uh, if if it doesn't, then we we give it zero, and and this way we can fine tune our gen uh, decoder to actually be able to produce programs that are different from supervised training data set, um, but but with this flavor that uh, if they produce the right output, they're still actually good to uh, good to train on. And we saw actually using this reward mechanism and adding diversity in the beam, uh, it was able to actually improve performance. Uh, quite quite a bit on top of just the supervised learning. Uh, we tested it, uh, the train network on synthetic data set on, on problems from the uh, Stanford's uh, homework and class test. Uh, we, we had about 16 problems and the network actually was able to solve seven uh, out of them, uh, write programs for them. One of the interesting ones she the network was able to produce was this particular problem where it, it was fairly complicated uh, uh, program and the network was able to write that uh, from these examples. There's still a long way to go but I think uh, it was still kind of promising that I was expecting zero problems uh, so, so at least it did something something better. But I think in longer term actually we, we probably need to go beyond uh, just using, uh, using uh, neural techniques actually uh, one of the ideas we are now pursuing is can we combine these neural search techniques with more symbolic methods that use constraint solving to do more precise reasoning of, of, of uh, programs and there's actually a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, now now also I wanted to briefly talk about uh, in addition to synthesis as we were discussing earlier there are many other application domains that can be enabled by learning good pro program embedding models. So for example one of the domains we were looking at was program repair, where, uh, can, where the idea was given an incorrect program, can the model learn to predict uh, both where the problem is and how to how to fix the bug. And this was actually we were trying to do it in the context of online uh, MOOC courses, where there are like typically hundred thousand students signing up for a class, but then we don't have enough TAs to give them precise uh, feedback on what part of program it's wrong and how to fix it. Uh, but one nice property here is that since everybody is solving the same set of assignments, there's lots and lots of data uh, of both correct and incorrect programs. And one of the things we found actually in this case, uh, the introduction to Python class um, on, on uh, edX, uh, there were many submissions, uh, student actually uh, almost 30, 30 to 40 percent submissions had syntax errors, um, which is kind of interesting. But also, and also many of them had uh, semantic errors, which were like choosing using the wrong operator or using wrong uh, constants and variables and all, all kinds of other things. So, so here our model basically looks at uh, trains a model, uh, embedding model for all correct programs. And when an incorrect program comes in, it actually identifies locations uh, for both syntax and semantic errors and predicts how to change the program such that now it becomes uh, functionally equivalent to what uh, a teacher implementation would do. So, uh, so there's some actually lots of interesting ideas there to explore. Uh, there's also some work we were uh, doing where we wanted to go beyond just syntax of the program. So here, uh, for example, here are two programs that are doing quite different algorithms. One is doing bubble sort, the other is doing insertion sort. Uh, but but uh, looking at syntax, they look quite similar. Uh, so it, it's difficult to actually distinguish between the two just looking at the syntax. But instead, actually, since programs we can execute, we can run these programs and get uh, st state traces, runtime traces, which hopefully capture some more semantics that are difficult to infer just from the syntax. Uh, so one of the ideas we were pursuing was, can we actually leverage these traces for uh, getting program embeddings uh, and there are actually many ways to embed program traces uh, uh, for example one can actually for every variable uh, we could look at the sequence of values it takes and then use a recurrent network like GRUs or, uh, or some other sequence models to embed 
these values into some vector and then we can do a pooling over all variables to get a program representation. Uh, similarly, we could also do this in a hierarchical way where we first embed every program state individually and then we do an embedding over all states, sequence of states. So a state here is defined as a sequence of values for different variables. So we can first have a recurrent network that embeds every value in a state and then we can have another uh, network on the top uh, that embeds each uh, state embedding as a sequence. Uh, so this is an alternate way to embed traces and then actually we could also do a hybrid between the two which which we finally used, uh, which has benefits of both state and variable modeling. And it turned out actually this was quite quite uh, descriptive of um, program behavior compared to just looking at the syntax. Uh, another application domain where program embeddings are could be useful are automatically generating test cases, uh, so, or for example, for uh, in in software engineering literature, people also call this fuzzing, where the idea is uh, given some program, you want to randomly generate inputs uh, to find these corner cases and bugs uh, uh, in these programs and crashes. So, so typically it works quite well, but when we have structured inputs, uh, it doesn't do so well. Uh, for example, let's say I'm, I'm trying to find uh, problems in PDF parser or any type of structured parser it takes a complex input as um, a, a complex structured input. Uh, so if we randomly make changes in this in this input files very quickly we get invalid PDF or invalid JPEG file. Um, so the idea here is that can we learn a generative model over uh, lots of structured inputs such that uh, given the program it can now lead to newer branches and more coverage than just random mutation. And here also we can take uh, we can learn from only inputs take program into account and do a hybrid as well. Um, so, so actually in summary, uh, I showed you some ways where uh, some of the recent techniques on using uh, uh, neural architectures for uh, program search and program synthesis uh, that can uh, take in as specification various different forms and generate programs in different languages in different domains. Uh, one of the key I think research area right now is what are good representations to represent uh, good embeddings to represent programs and then also how to perform search uh, more effectively and there are many many interesting proposals and actually some of them you will also hear more about later in the in, in the course uh, so so that's a very active area of research and lots of actually fundamental questions are still waiting to be answered and lots of exciting problems similarly in terms of application domains as well in addition to synthesis there are many, many uh, cool application domains that can be enabled to help programmers even today. Uh, um, for example, we saw rep program repair, finding bugs, program optimization. There are many, many application domains, which hopefully some of you would also uh, look at potential projects uh, later in the class. So that was mostly it. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe via email and, and hopefully in a couple of weeks when I'm there in person I'd love to discuss more on some of these ideas and also other ideas uh, related ideas um, in person so so take care everyone uh, it was great, great to uh, give this talk and I'll see you soon in person take care bye bye